welcome to Student Hours. Joining me today is Dr. Tom Penfold. How are you doing, Tom? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Joe? Not too bad, thank you very much. To start, yeah. I was wondering if you could please tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background, and then what began your interest in history? Yeah, so I'm an associate lecturer in sort of African history here at UCL. Been here two years or so. Uh, sort of background to that, uh, previously worked in Johannesburg, the University of Johannesburg, where I focused a lot on sort of African history and the interactions with performance culture in particular around song uh, and that was a postdoc position following my PhD which I did at the University of Birmingham. Uh, I would sort of resist the term being a historian, I'm sort of actively trying to be very interdisciplinary with everything I've done and I've tried to do that sort of since I started my postgraduate studies really. Uh, very much, obviously history is part of that but I, I wouldn't see myself as a sort of traditional archival researcher. Why not, do you think? Just because um, you do a number of different things as well? Yeah, because I do a number of different things. I'm actively, you know, my undergrad was in literature, English literature, which I've always sort of kept a sort of passion for, so I focus a lot on poetry, fiction. More recently, I sort of branched into song and performance culture. And I think that is, to me, where some of the dynamism, dynamism is in Africa in particular around sort of political debate and has been for a long time so I, I don't see that as having stopped or finished so I don't feel like history su suggests to me some sort of end point, some fixed conclusion which I don't think we see we, these trends continue to move forward so I sort of don't like boxing myself into one discipline or another because I think it's the energy comes from the mix of, of all of them coming, you know, coming together. Absolutely, that's a very interesting point actually, not to take anything away from you, but do you think that's perhaps a bit of a misconception in general? I Just the brief time I've now been doing this, I've mm -hmm. kind of realised that with just academics in general, you, you're never just doing one thing, there's always a lot yep. going on behind the scenes perhaps. Um, so I just said, moving just from history specifically, is that maybe just quite a common thing that actually academics don't like to be seen just as a historians or psychologists or... or I, I think in a way it's impossible to just be one or the other, yeah? Right. You, you, these boxes help to sort of label, but when it actually comes to reality, you know, real life merges and flicks, so I don't think it actually, it's ever possible to really box yourself in. So I think academics are naturally doing what you have to do by following their interests. It takes you into all these other disciplines. Uh, and universities actively always try and promote the sort of idea of interdisciplinarity, mm. uh, which, which is part of it, whether that's brought into practice or not, or it's just a buzzword, and I suppose is in a debate for another time. But yeah, I think, you know, there is energy within all this, and you follow reality, and that takes you into a multiplicity of direction. Uh, and that's great, and that's hopefully what we're going to get into later today, about the different directions it's taking you into. Yeah especially with history, because everything has a history, history links into everything, so yeah, I think mm -hmm. that's interesting. What was it about South Africa specifically, sorry, that then drew you to that as an area of research for yourself? Yeah, I think what sort of struck me is, I've, I've never had a sort of set trajectory, and to some degree I'd answer that question by sort of saying I fell into South Africa, uh, fell into African studies. I think when I did my undergraduate, I did my dissertation focusing on sort of representations of race in African fiction. Uh, and a lot of the stuff I used was South African fiction, which sort of led me to that. And then I ended up applying for sort of the postgrad stuff at Birmingham in African studies because I deliberately wanted to do something that was interdisciplinarity. And African studies as an area of studies discipline allowed me to do that, to do a little bit of everything. And I sort of got the bug and, and found sort of, I suppose, a different energy, a different vibe almost within African studies. Uh, there was something a bit different which rubbed against reality, I suppose, to some degree of how we look at it in the West. We, we view Africa through a very particular lens, and actually when you start to study it, you realise that lens is a bit wonky. And I, I suppose that was some of what really enticed me into it. Uh, and it gave me the opportunity to go to South Africa and sort of to be part of that life and the sort of vibe out there uh, really caught me. And coming back here motivated by this fierce desire all the time to sort of to demonstrate that you know we look at Africa from the West uh, see this in the media we see this in the Academy um, the lens is always one of poverty or one of struggle yeah and I think 
yes, they're both there, but also they're not the only thing there. Mm. And I think trying to demonstrate to students that through my teaching now that actually there's so much else going on in the continent, which isn't just struggle or poverty, mm. but is good. And that's something I'm trying to bring through. So I think that desire almost to prove that, to show that to students is what keeps, keeps me going. Yeah, that's a great point, very well said. I think, why do you think that is um, in the West? I know this is quite a, a big question in terms of the perception, at least traditionally, and I think still is now, mm -hmm. of Africa. But as you said, it's either sort of poverty or, or these kind of issues which obviously are there. Why do you think that's the case? Do you think it's just ignorance on the mainstream uh, case, or it's more there's more to it than that? Why do you think there's such a misconception? I think some of it's ignorance. I think there's a complication and sort of you know these things require unpacking because they are there and you can't not you can't avoid them they are there but they're part of this much bigger picture and i think sometimes the time available in the west to unpack some of that complication and to bring through this other stuff isn't really there mm. so i think that's some of it uh i don't really know some of it's probably related to colonial history and sort of an assumed sort of superiority we have in the west via the africa which I think, you know, we want to thus position in a certain way, that sort of idea of othering coming through, which I think still holds to some degree. So that's definitely part of it. I think it's a myriad of all these different factors. And we don't, we don't teach it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's big debates over if we should teach the empire. And I talk to my students, you know, when they start my courses here, and none of them, very few have ever taught, ever learned anything African before. That's a great point. I mean, I always think back. Uh, this is also just linked to making history, I think, interesting from a grassroots level in general. I think the English traditional kind of history system, if you like, is, is very much focused usually the Tudors yeah. or World War II, World War One. which don't get me wrong, there's a place mm. for Of course, it's interesting to know, but there's so much more yeah. out there, N not just with Africa, just in general. So that, mm. that's a great point. Um, do you think it's starting to change because it's obviously the the huge sort of movement going on mm -hmm. um, across universities sort of decolonizing the curriculum and yeah. that kind of thing. Do you think we're starting to see a shift in that? I think we're beginning to see a shift and I think that shift is also having some pushback. Mm. Uh, empires increasingly, I suppose, coming in in different ways, probably not enough. My issue is with this is we, we still need to be careful of uh, sort of positioning it and sort of empire in general and everything through this idea of decolonization is whether something was right or wrong. Uh, and I think that's the tendency, and that's why we get this debate and criticism, that if you teach it, you automatically sort of have to praise it or completely criticise it. Mm. Uh, you can't do either, and that's not the point of it, yeah? These things have happened. We need to explain and show what they are, show their importance and their connections. It's not about necessarily judging them. And I think that's where the debate often falls down around sort of decolonising the curriculum, just because we're trying to bring in more black voices or teach you know, India or Africa and the empire and some of the stuff that went on there isn't necessarily to just demonise British activity, mm. although in many respects it was wrong, we should be critical of it. Uh, and it's also not to praise, you know, we shouldn't just celebrate railways as a colonial invention and say, look at all the benefit they brought. Yeah? It's not about imposing these judgments, it's about having a conversation and showing where, you know, how important this stuff is and, and what it's shaped. Absolutely, and seeing the nuance in yeah. arguments, I think that's a great point as well because so much so I think in, uh, I see anyway, on, on, on mainstream media when they mm -hmm. have these kind of discussions, it's really not that at all, it's very much framed as you said of, of is it right or wrong and it's going to be a two minute debate or something. Mm -hmm. And I think how can anything truly be achieved for that kind of discourse and that's, that's um, so sort of what discussions like this, I think, are more popular these days yeah. because you can have proper dis uh, yeah. conversations about it. Uh, what was your first time in South Africa like? What was that first trip like? Uh, I went in 2012 for a few months. Uh, so it was it was a weird one. First time I'd sort of been abroad by myself for a long period of time. Uh, so that was in itself a sort of moment. Uh, sort of it's eye opening. It, it's very, very different, uh, sort of landing in the middle of Johannesburg in for hustle and bustle. Uh, you know, I'm, I suppose I'm a country boy from rural Worcestershire, so <laughs> I don't have that necessarily, you know, sort of that experience. Uh, so that was eye opening. I think it takes some adapting to, uh, but there's a real 
energy to it and there is a new way of being and of people seeing and interactions which I found people are so so friendly there's a positivity all the time which sort of really rubbed off uh, and again counter to how we often see I was these things say. yeah <laughs> uh, which I loved and want to be wanted to be part of and I think I ended up sort of staying longer and longer until 2017 uh, end of 2017 when I came back so I think that is yeah it's eye opening you have to be aware of stuff but you know it's different but anywhere abroad is different yeah it's Absolutely. about immersing yourself in that and, and taking the time to, to understand and, and be part of it what do you think was the most maybe eye opening aspect of your time in South Africa that kind of caught your eye first and foremost it's a good question uh, I don't really know I don't think I could identify just one thing to sort of duck the question a bit uh, <laughs> I think there is there's just a real energy to it and I suppose for me something that struck me is how music seems to be massively everywhere you went hmm. uh, there used to be an embrace of music and sound and dance and movement there, there it is just an energy about it through culture I suppose this open embrace of different cultures in a way I don't think we necessarily sort of have here we're sometimes a bit more closeted reserved, or yeah. reserved yeah interesting and that sort of brings us on to the next sort of topic because um, a lot of your research obviously then went into performance and uh, specifically also poetry mm -hmm. yeah. um, in particular Soweto poetry um, or I can say so could you talk please a little bit about what Soweto poetry is and sort of its origins and maybe its distinct characteristics yeah so uh, Soweto poetry is is sort of a, a form of poetry linked to the black consciousness movement in South Africa which forms in the 1970s as a sort of opposition movement to apartheid uh, I don't know if you want me to sort of flesh out some of the I think that'd be a good idea yeah. It's, it's, so, yeah. so yeah, form of is something we've obviously heard about and whenever you hear South Africa mentioned apartheid generally follows within a mm -hmm. sentence or two uh, so yeah, it's a form of white minority rule which starts in 1948 uh, led by the Africana sort of white establishment which are sort of descendants of Dutch settlers and the British settlers are sort of part of sort of whiteness I suppose which comes co-opted into the same same space uh, which deny basic rights to black South Africans and Indian South Africans and coloured South Africans uh, those mixed race uh, and segregate the country on racial lines uh, would simply inform every most walks of life you can think of would there be segregation so even if you went to try to walk into a shop there were designated en entrances uh, benches were reserved for whites or non-whites, like all aspects of life were reserved. Uh, so deep oppression, deep racial segregation, which is apartheid. Uh, various sort of challenges towards this. And black consciousness comes along in sort of the late 1960s, 68, 69, uh, led by a sort of university student, a medical student uh, called Steve Biko, who, as I say, is a black student, uh, who takes a very sort of theoretical intellectual approach to apartheid I suppose and tries to take a step back he identifies that the sort of strongest weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed I, if you oppress somebody long enough you start to think like the oppressor wants you to think yeah that your position in society is secondary and that should be the space you sort of you, you hold uh, so he identifies that and sets about encouraging black South Africans to think through that and shed that sort of mental oppression, yeah? And he says that's the first step to any form of liberation. You can't do anything politically and explicitly until you stop thinking mm. the way they want you to think. Uh, so to do that, he encourages this embrace of African culture, African history, African identity, uh, to, to, you know, to become human again, in his words, to feel sense of yourself back. And sorry to interrupt, um, yeah. what was his background, so he was a student, but who was he kind of working with, if you know what I mean, so how did his movement sort of come about? Uh, was it just him or did he have sort of particular... Yeah, so it's a, it's a university-based movement, so there's a, a student sort of organisation called the National Union of South African Students, which is a sort of non-racial student union, uh, which protests against apartheid. 
but in the late 60s, uh, B. Cohen and some fellow blacks Africans within this movement get a bit frustrated at the direction it's going in and sort of saying they're not really talking about what we need them to talk about yet. They talk right. in general terms or they talk about uh, what's going on in university campuses and all that sort of stuff. They don't fundamentally understand how apartheid affects us mm. as black South Africans. Yeah, and because New South, as it's called, this national union, is a non-racial dominated by white people, liberal white people, right. you know, they obviously don't understand because they right. don't share that experience. So there's frustration at this and essentially they break off. These group of black South African students who were members of that break off, led by Biko, and set up their own organisation called SASO, which is South African Students' Organisation, which is much more about this idea of black consciousness and promoting African rights and African awareness of their own situation, speaking to and of themselves. Mm. So he's yeah, he's part of a sort of wider organisation, I suppose, right. based on university campus. Right, and so then with uh, the Soweto poetry, mm -hmm. how did these two connect to each other? Yeah, so as, as I said, black consciousness is about this reclamation of sort of African identity. Mm -hmm. And it identifies, I think, culture as a key weapon in doing this. Yeah, if you want to celebrate African history, African identity, culture is a good way of doing that, of promoting it and talking about that. So there's a group of poets linked to the movement who begin to write their own poetry to celebrate black history, black identity. And this is an intensely urban form of poetry. It's very much based in the lived experience of Africans in urban areas, in particular Johannesburg. Uh, and the largest sort of township where black South Africans were resident in Johannesburg is Soweto. Uh, so they sort of, this is a genre named after where most of them are based and write about, which is, is Soweto hence the name of Soweto poetry. So yeah, so poetry very much about promoting African identity, African history, the African experience, and doing that in a way that's seen by the sort of literary establishment as anti-poetic. Uh, it doesn't really care for aesthetics and sort of traditional markers of literariness. Mm. Yeah, it sort of does away with that and is about it's still very aesthetic, it's still amazing poetry, but there's a very real political thrust to it as well, which is quite immediately obvious in most cases. And in what ways can, um, I don't know if this is maybe an obvious question, but like, how can poetry help with sort of pushing forward political movements, or specifically in this case, how was it used to enhance the movement yeah. or engage with it? Yeah, so a lot of this poetry, there's, there's debates around this, and a lot would say, uh, this poetry is, is, is written and it is a written form, but it's also highly performed. Like it's performed at political rallies, at, you know, at performance events. So there it has a direct mobilising effect, right? Yeah, which is clearly part of how it becomes this political thing, because it mobilises people. And this poetry in general in South Africa through the anti-apartheid struggle takes on this role in different forms. The 1980s, for example, trade unions embraced poetry massively. And again, it's a way of mobilising, getting people behind it, sharing your message, bringing people together, showing them what's happening, getting them to associate with something and pushing them on to the struggle to, to push forward. So I think it's element as a sort of performative genre is a key aspect of, of that. But also I think just because it raises awareness and the political message was fairly obvious, just by consuming it, reading it or listening to it, it makes you stop and think. Interesting. And was there an element as well that, um, because I'm, I'm not sure of the laws at the time, in terms of there was much censorship going on in terms of political movements, was there an element as well that because it's poetry, this is a way of getting across political messages that could be seen to be dangerous by the people in power, that mm -hmm. because it's got the element of performance in poetry, they can kind of disguise it, or was it because it was also quite clear about their, their yeah. political message, it, it actually wasn't that? Yeah, yeah there is definite, there is censorship going on at this period. Uh, and some of the poetry falls foul to that, some of the poetry publications fall foul to that and are banned. Uh, and it also affects other forms of performance. So there's like street theatre which goes on in the townships where people get together and sort of produce ad hoc performances, theatre pieces, and they generally do that in the street and then they might have to jump onto their van and drive off at any minute in case the authorities come down and try and close down that space. So it's a sort of very temporary sort of moving, influx, move, right. moving around sort of influx movement. And creatives go into sort of conversation 
with censorship in different ways. Uh, so that's one, trying to avoid it and move to the next place and perform the play again. Uh, there's a literary journal called the Staff Rider as well. Uh, and a lot of the Soweto poets, those chaps who write Soweto poetry, publish in this journal, uh, which does photography and short stories and editorial pieces. It's just a sort of literary journal promoting Slovak African culture. And that's well known for actually going into direct conversation with the government censorship board. Oh, really? So when sort of that would, they put it together, then the government would censor it and they say, you can't put that story and they publish a blank page and say, you know, to clearly show there was something there which is being censored. Or in another occasion, they published the exchange of letters with the censorship board discussing a particular story and why they banned it or why they've asked for something to be changed and what Staff Rider's response to that was. So they go into this sort of direct conversation to actually show what's happening with this censorship sort of that's going on. Interesting. And so then how does this all um, move forward and, and sort of culminate in terms of the black conscious movement? As in, I, I'm pretty sure it, it still, it, it doesn't just stop, it's still actually present today. Uh, this is where or... we, I suppose, in a, it depends how you think of it. Right. Uh, as a movement, as a sort of political entity, black consciousness largely stops in the late 1970s. And why is that? Uh, there's, there's two reasons. Firstly, you have what are known as Soweto Uprising. So, yes, yeah, Soweto, Soweto poetry, yes, but black consciousness is very much sort of based on the young. It's a university-based movement which spreads outwards, but it mainly stays within university students, secondary school students, you know, that's sort of the target audience, I suppose. Mm. Those are the people who really push this message. And in 1976, the government introduced a law saying that education in, in schools has to be 50% Afrikaans, which is that language of the apartheid government and 50% in English. What, why do they put that law in place? Because you're essentially asking people to prepare themselves to some degree for their role in society and you want to limit black identity in some way and obviously this is a white European dominated society and black South Africans are seen as there to work for you so it's about controlling your identity to some degree and making sure you're able to work well and you can take orders and instruction which would be in English or in Afrikaans. Right, yeah. so this is essentially just a, a, a one of a number of acts, I'm guessing, yeah. and policies that have been passed over years to try and sort of yeah. suppress. And so, then, so, yeah, it's further suppressing sort of African identity sure. and, you know, their oppression within society on all these different levels. Uh, so the students protest in this and they go on a march through Soweto, uh, which culminates in sort of confrontation with the police, which turns violent. Several of the children, uh, one of the youngest victims was 14, so a shot, a shot and killed. Uh, and then after that, sort of this violence spreads across the country, but that causes the sort of apartheid government to come back quite harshly on any form of resistance, because obviously, you know, Soweto's happened, it's led to this uprising, which forces a lot of people allied to black consciousness who are part of this movement to, to leave in exile uh, to surrounding southern African countries. So that is one of the incidents which sort of closes down black consciousness, because leading black consciousness think that they're now not in South Africa. Mm. Uh, the other one a year later is the death of Steve Biko himself, who's killed in police custody, uh, sort of, well, murdered, but never sort of officially murdered. Mm. <laughs> and that obviously removes the sort of key leadership figure. So as a movement, it dies in late 1970s mm. but yeah as an ideology I think arguably it's still going uh, it is about making people think in a certain way yeah mm. and that style of thinking still still resonates right and that brings us on to the the roads must fall mm -hmm. and the fees must fall movement yeah. I saw that I believe were you connected at all to that that movement or did some kind of work to do with that movement? I wasn't connected I was there while it was happening but I wasn't right, okay. actively sort of right. part of it, but I was working at the University of Johannesburg while all the universities in, well, most of the universities in South Africa were sort of experiencing these protests and closing down, so I wasn't sort of actively part of the movement, but I was, I was in that space. Right, interesting. Well, and then for, uh, for those who don't know, Sherry, could you please explain what the Roads Must Fall and the Fees Must Fall movement was about? Please. Yeah, so two separate issues which sort of coalesce. Uh, start with, with Roads Must Fall, because it's the first one. 
for starts in 2015 at the University of Cape Town because there's a statue there of Cecil John Rhodes, who is a British imperialist uh, who sort of is working at, in Cape Town, well, in the Cape Colony, with that part of sort of southern South Africa in the 1800s, uh, leading mining magnate, uh, also part of the British Southern African Company, which sort of work, sort of expands and takes control of uh, Rhodesia, which is present day Zimbabwe. So British imperialists, sort of very checkered history, uh, you know, seen as playing and actively proven to be part of the oppression and the murder of, of one of the black Africans, hundreds. Uh, uh, but he he had gifted the land that the University of Cape Town is on to the university because he owned Raceway and that. So he's got a statue there memorialising him on the grounds of the University of Cape Town. Uh, so in 2015, a student throws uh, a bucket of poop on the statue, black South African student, uh, sort of saying, you know. And that is reminiscent, I suppose, what he's sort of saying through that, the student, is university spaces are still fundamentally based around whiteness and European ideals. Yeah, you, they're taught it generally, language reconstruction is English, uh, you know, the, the landscape has got, you know, buildings named after British imperialists or people who are, you know, colonists. Uh, statues are still up there, mm. artwork, all this sort of stuff. They, they feel like colonial spaces still. Mm. And African history, African identity, African ways of being, African culture aren't necessarily present in these spaces. Uh, so it's a pushback against that. And like, yes, we can come to university, but we're still being made to feel secondary because of how the universities are set up, I suppose, which links this like, whole idea of needing to decolonize the curriculum as, right. as well. Uh, so that leads to some pushback and some protests which spread across the universities and echo internationally. And we've had very small movements here in, in Oxford in particular, again, another statue of Cecil John Road. So that sort of roads must fall. Fees must fall sort of comes slightly later uh, and is linked to the cost of education in South Africa for South African students. Uh, and it's that's, I suppose, in some ways a more complicated story. Uh, university sort of costs are, tuition costs in South Africa are high could say as they are here. I think the difference is while there is some government funding available to students, only covers the very, very poor uh, students in, in South Africa. And there's a great majority of what are called the missing middle. Uh, so these are students whose, whose family income is enough to cover tuition fees, yeah? So you don't qualify for a government grant because right. you've got it's like enough paying. to do the tuition. But it's their sort of income is not enough to cover university life, mm. so it won't necessarily cover accommodation, or food, or travel to and from university, or the books you need to study. Yeah, it just fundamentally covers you getting onto the course, mm. and there's no support for that. And so that sort of fees must fall as a pushback against the cost of education, given that sort of most people still are priced out of education. Uh, when the ANC government, when it came to power, and frequently since, sort of those who liberated from apartheid, from actually led initially by Nelson Mandela in 94, uh, had always talked about providing free education to everybody. So there's this dissatisfaction within students now, why are we, pay, one, paying so much when you promise free education, and two, why can't most of actually afford to go when you promise free education? Mm. So it, it's pushed back against that and sort of the campaign for free, quality, decolonised education. And these sort of two fallist movements, Rose must fall, fees must fall, converge, uh, I suppose, as 2016 goes on. Right, and I'll definitely come back to the fees must fall, but maybe focusing specifically on the roads must fall. I wanted to ask what your thoughts are on removal of statues and those <laughs> kind of things, because uh, going almost back to the beginning of this, I want to speak about the nuance of it because I think from, a, from the face value, and in my opinion, yeah, I think it's, it's a good thing to take down the statues mm -hmm. because they're celebrating, you know, just by having a statue, you're kind of celebrating, in my opinion at least, certain yeah. figures of the past. And for people who go to this university, they want to feel comfortable. So I, I understand the reasons for mm -hmm. taking against it. 
I'm interested in understanding why people would have pushback against taking down statues in terms of not just even the fact of, you know, it, people would argue it's like rioting or something. I just want to know what your thoughts are on, the, 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 on both sides, if you know what mm -hmm. I mean, about taking down statues. Because I do think it is an interesting issue. Yeah, yeah so like, round of a little bit. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. no. And we, we, you know, we've had debates around sort of this at UCL as well. Mm over the old mascot of the Student Union, who's sort of part of Britain, Britain's imperial past. Uh, and I sort of, the, the pushback to this is obviously, you know, by taking down a statue, you're sort of trying to erase or rewrite history. Yeah, mm. and we can't, it's gone. Uh, and the argument is traditionally from the right that we should be part, you know, we should be proud of this history. We can't just rewrite it and sort of pretend it's not there, because mm. it is. And I, 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 get, I get that. But obviously, you know, we have to be aware that statues in particular, because they dominate space, make people feel a very certain way, depending on their history and their identity and what they commemorate. And that's why there's legitimate reasons to take them down. And, you know, why should we celebrate people like Rose, who, you know, whose past does lead directly or indirectly to the death of hundreds of black people? Like, why should we celebrate that? My sort of debate around, my sort of view, I suppose, is a bit more nuanced. I wouldn't go for, I don't think you can keep them up as they are. I also don't see the point in removing them. I think, at least in some contexts, what's actually an interesting thing to do is think about how we can rework them. Uh, to do something with the statue, be that deface it or change it or put some some additions to it that demonstrate the power of this moment we're in now that we're actually having these debates yeah mm. that this history is there but it's something that is causing people to stop and think and to have discussion so why can't we try and do something to those statues particularly in some spaces which are heavily curated like you know the universities where there's a bit more control of what you can you can do why can't we do something that allows us to have that debate and, and shows that debate's going on, yeah? So it doesn't try and change history. If you can't do anything about but, history, yes. but, but celebrates mm. that we are having a debate and we are identifying rightly what that history actually is and it's not this sort of thing we should be just blanketly celebrating. Interesting. What sort of things do you think we could do with it then? That's the bit where I don't really know. Yes. <laughs> I've sort of got this theoretical idea mm. uh, but yeah I don't really know in terms of what we could actually sort of do around that I suppose and I some of me thinks it needs to content continually be temporary to make these statues stay there but become a blank canvas for students for not just students but people to act on uh, at all times and I think this is some of the growing sort of dissatisfaction in the moment we're in now particularly sort of as a current decolonial moment, where this idea that we've always done a lot of talking around change, around race relations and that sort of stuff, and nothing's really actually changed. Mm. So maybe we should stop talking and start doing. And do something more performative and spontaneous and that sort of thing. So why can't these sort of statues be a canvas for that sort of continual rewriting and spontaneity? I suppose the problem with that sort of theoretical idea is obviously where the boundaries between that sort of rewriting and spontaneity and sort of vandalism. Well, that, that's the, what do you think it takes for more actual action to be taken? Because that's the thing, I don't know if, um, I think that's a, another really good point because it goes back to what I said earlier about it. usually you just see again a two minute or a ten minute mm -hmm. conversation about these things. I, and, they almost self-congratulate themselves. Well, it's great we're having the conversation. We've been having the conversation. Yeah. We've talked about it. You can go back to the fifties or so, so, the, mm -hmm. the conversation's always been going on. And this is about a number of issues, not even just the one we're speaking about today. But what do you think leads to? I mean, I, this goes back to old taking down and such. That is action, you could argue. But I don't know. I, I think. Do you believe it has to start from the kind of the ground below, or do you think there is a way of? getting those in power to, to take a bit more action. I don't know, or is it just to do with personal accountability, I don't know. You know, and as I say, I was part of a, a panel here at UCL discussing sort of our, the student union mascot and what to do with that. And the panel was essentially, what should we do with it? And we talked about it for an hour and a half. 
and got to the end of the conversation and were none the wiser. Uh, just sort of demonstrated this is just an endless process of talking through mm. the point. In terms of what we can do, I think, yeah, some sort of, I think an element of personal accountability sort of is part of what we need to do. I think we need to em embrace, celebrate the possibility of change. And I think that's some of it, is this sort of change is often seen in this sort of negative, critical light. Yeah, that it means something must have been bad before and could be good again. Mm. We can, it was bad, now we're gonna make it good or we're gonna make it different, yeah? And I think that's the problem, is how we debate change. So we need to change the mindset around that, that changing something, taking action, doesn't necessarily, again, just go back to the idea of passing judgment. It doesn't mean everything that's gone before was bad and everything's gonna come again in the future is good. Mm. Yeah, those binaries don't exist. Mm. There's good in the bad, there's bad in the good. So we need to fundamentally, I think, have a different understanding of what change is. And that allows us, I think, more room to do stuff, to change things. And from your experience as a teacher as well, have you noticed maybe a different mentality in the sort of younger generations at all, do you think, compared to when you were growing up? Do you think the mentality shifted a bit? Do you think, and again, you obviously you can't generalise, mm -hmm. but do you think people are more willing to take that more approach where it is a more nuanced approach, it's not about just saying it's either bad or good, or what do you think, do you think it's still quite inflammatory, I suppose? I think it's, it's a hard one, it's hard to sort of not generalise with students, mm. and obviously I'm, I sway slightly because I, I teach African history, so the type of students I'm teaching are coming from generally from a certain perspective and certain way of thinking. Mm. Uh, I do see a willingness to be more critical, uh, to look on the past, to change it. I think there is an insatisfaction, an impatience, uh, which I think is typical of that sort of younger generation, sort of generation Y. And again, this is I, where I think like Rosemary School comes from in South Africa, is this, it's an impatience, which mm. has reached a, a moment where the lid's blown off. Yeah, frustration. So I, I, I get a sense teaching of this sort of impatience from students. They are more willing to have critical discussions uh, and want to know these other histories, these smaller histories in terms of weight we put on them. Mm -hmm. That by and uh, the one thing I would say though is sometimes you still get a tendency within students to sort of, although they want to do that, they still try and pass these sort of quite binary black and white categories on stuff, on whether something's good or bad or not. And I remember having sort of debated this with students several years ago around sort of should we criticise, can we only criticise colonialism or is there something to praise for? And I think sometimes there is this inability to, you know, just generally say, no, that was bad. And there's an inability to actually have a sort of nuanced discussion around that. So I think there's still that tendency, although there's a willingness to look at these more smaller marginal histories, I think there's still sometimes a tendency to jump to a conclusion and to label something as bad and good. It's just generally the opposite to what the old generation might have thought about bad and worse. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully things do change a little bit, I, I don't know. But um, going back to the sort of roads must fall and those, mm -hmm. these mo movements, I'm interested to know the current state of South Africa. Obviously, you've spoke a little bit about the colonial past to do with apartheid and all these sort of things. But um, I mean, I've actually got a quote here from uh, Steve Byte, who said in 1973, that the basic problem in South Africa has been analysed by liberal whites to be apartheid. The thesis is in fact a strong white racism. And so this sort of highlights um, whilst you could maybe remove apartheid and while there may be a law to them in place that suggests progress is being made, a lot of the problems are really much deeper rooted than simple laws. I wondered what your opinion was on the current state of South Africa in relation to, I guess, its colonial past. And you've mentioned a lot of the issues kind of raised in these movements mm -hmm. directly to do with the colonial past of the things they were being taught or weren't being taught. Yeah. What's your opinion on the current state? Yeah, like? so sort of where we are now, I think there is a re-evaluation of sort of post-apartheid South Africa in relation to its past. And a lot has changed, uh, undoubtedly. And you see that, that there's a black president and has been for the last 35 years. Uh, and everybody has the vote. And there's a black middle class which is growing. And like a lot has changed and you can't take away from that. But inequality to form some statistics is, is worse now than it was under apartheid, economic really? inequality. 
uh, you know, vast majority, again, of, of black South African stories in, in deep poverty. Uh, struggle to get to school, don't necessarily have food on the table, might not have running water, you know, so the inequality is very, very real. And I think there's been an increasing sort of reevaluation of how do we, where do we put the emphasis? Should we celebrate what has changed or should we still be critical and say, but why is the other stuff still the situation? Right. Yeah, so I think there's an increasing sort of reevaluation of this. And I think there's a tendency to say that this struggle's not necessarily finished. Mm. Uh, and I think that's where the younger generation are coming in. And sort of one critic talking about sort of roads must fall has talked about how younger students feel like they've had to pick the relay race, that it was sort of, this struggle went through, the baton was carried until 1994 when apartheid ended. Then sort of students, current students, parents, generation, dropped that bat on and thought, oh, we can just celebrate things, it's happening. And nothing really changed. And now students have had to pick it back up again mm. and continue this struggle to try and actually radically overhaul what's gone before. So I think that is sort of the general tendency. There is a sort of desire to continue this struggle to ensure that there is more radical overhaul, that things do change more than they have done. And you see this in culture. You see this through these protest movements around Rose, Rose Must Fall and that sort of thing. If you look at the songs that are performed by students at the protests, in particular, these are the struggle songs. These were songs that were performed by protesters during apartheid. So through that, you're actually sort of sonically positioning yourself within that wider history of struggle. Mm. So yeah, I think there's definitely that sort of re-evaluation, a more critical look at what Nelson Mandela and, did, and others did when they came to power in 1994, and perhaps they didn't sort of cause revolution in quite the same way they did with the underlying structures of apartheid, particularly around the economy, are still dominant. Interesting, and what, what more do you think, um, what are the main steps do you think towards improving the situation then in terms of the economic inequality? I know this that's a, like a huge question, mm -hmm. it was just such a simple answer. I'm, I'm just, you know, then what are your thoughts on that in terms of what more can be done? I think there needs to be an empowering of the younger generation, I think, mm -hmm. ultimately. I think, and you see this across Africa, uh, that you know, Africa is the youngest continent in the world. Uh, you know, over half the population are below 18. Uh, like they are the youngest generation and it is the young generation who's the catalyst of change. They're the one with the radical ideas, they're the ones who want to get things done. Yeah. And you know, you see that everywhere, that's just how we are. They're the ones with energy ultimately. <laughs> and I think they've generally been locked out. Uh, and I don't think this is just a South African thing, it's not just an African thing. I think you see this everywhere. That you know, look at the presidents of the US, for example, their age. I think the younger generation have been locked out of politics a bit. And I think they're the ones with the ideas. So we need to empower them to do things with those ideas. And get them in, do that? get them involved. So yeah, and how can we do that for the younger main ways to empower the younger people? Uh, it, dep it depends where you look. I think embracing their voices in a way, instead of just sort of demonizing or trying to shut them down or labeling them woke, you know, actually yeah. think why are they saying what they're saying and give them that respect, listen to them just hear them uh, that's that's part of it I think you know in the UK for example we need to empower we need to political parties need proact need to be try and be proactive in terms of how they present themselves and they present politics and how they go out there and get young people involved uh, and then if we're going to be more specific in Africa and in South Africa in particular there's a problem around within the ANC in particular, current government, where you get anywhere in the U in sort of the ANC by proving your struggle credentials, by proving what you did under apartheid and how you contributed to the liberation effort, how you contributed to the end of apartheid, and that obviously locks out the younger generation because they were born post nineteen ninety four, so they yeah. don't. It's harder to have those credentials. Mm. Yeah, so I think there needs to be a change of thinking around that. So I think, yeah, there's, there's loads of different ways. It depends where you are, but I think regardless of 
geographical setting, I think we do need to empower the youth more and give them tools and the platform to talk and bring about their ideas. And some of it might be failure, but some of it is going to be a real success as well. Yeah. And I also saw that you've uh, written a lot about Brazil's colonial situation or sort of the current state in relation to its colonial mm -hmm. past and the links between South Africa and Brazil in particular to its crime writing and fiction, yeah. but how this also links to the broader political mm -hmm. situation. Could you please speak a little bit about that? And also first again, how did you get interested in this as an area of research? Yeah. In terms of sort of how I got interested in it, that very much stems from sort of who I was working with when I was in South Africa, when I was based at the University of Johannesburg. Um, uh, my sort of mentor, I suppose, research mentor, which is a lady called Professor Liz Gunner, who works a lot on sort of songs in South Africa. Uh, but through our conversations, we've sort of noticed how song had been really important as a means of political mobilisation in sort of what we call cultures of struggle. So liberation movements across across the globe. Uh, so we've seen it in South Africa. Uh, you see it in Ireland, for example, song's quite important around sort of IRA protests and that sort of stuff. Uh, and you see it in Latin America and the pushback against the dictatorships of the 70s and 80s yeah. and protest around that. So we were sort of struck by this sort of marriage of, you know, the important song and performance took on in a very direct political sense. It wasn't just talking about politics, it was doing politics and changing politics. So I think we, was, we were struck by that similarity and wanted to do a, a bit more about it. And we sort of set up a, a reading group and a workshop, getting together different sort of academics who sort of work on either Latin America or work on Southern Africa. And we tried to look for these connections and these parallels. And that was a really stimulating sort of environment to be off. And you kept seeing where these histories chimed with each other, uh, despite having different sort of histories, despite being different linguistically, culturally there were still elements of sort of parallel. So that was sort of where it came from and, and, and being part of that. And that's something I wanted to do a bit more with and actually try and unpick that. Uh, so I tried to do it through thinking through fiction in particular. Why fiction? Because I suppose going, I, I miss my literature undergrad days sometimes I suppose and I you know I still like using fiction to see what it tells us about stuff because I think it does tell us something in a, quite a unique way so I wanted to think about that so that's why I sort of got into it and crime writing is this sort of genre that's boomed in both countries in sort of recent years and I wanted to see why it has and what it's telling us mm. and I think constantly by looking at crime writing although it's often dismissed as a sort of low literature, low brow genre, you know, it's just quick thrills. Uh, it actually does tell us something about the state of a nation. And by reading that, it was sort of, it felt like it was telling me similar things in sort of Brazil and, and South Africa. So I wanted to do a bit of a sort of comparison around some of that work and seeing what some of those connections were. Interesting, and um, I know Crime fiction, I think, is generally quite a popular genre. I think mm -hmm. globally, I think. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I'm not the expert, but uh, in particular, then, has it become really popular both in Brazil and South Africa? Then, and if so, why do you think that is? I think it's, it, as you say, it's become popular everywhere, mm -hmm. and you can see that sort of noir fiction, dark fiction. You know, look on Netflix, look on sort of W. H. Smith's bookshelves. You, right. you see crime fiction in different guises everywhere. It is a sort of thing that is is about. I think some of it because it is more, uh, people see it as a bit more accessible. Uh, it's it's an easier read, so I think from a sort of literary point of view, that's part of it. Same as romance has also become quite a popular fiction because it's seen as an easier read and less academically demanding, which people don't always want. Yeah, you just want to read a book and get lost in the plot. Mm. Uh, but I think the other thing is because it has this ability to hook onto really key issues within society, whatever they may be, uh, you know, not just the obvious ones around sort of police, but crime is something people resonate with. It can tap into issues around sexual violence or gender inequality, uh, race relation, like it has this ability to tap into really important issues that are current and standing out over time. Do you think there's a bit more honesty in crime writing in the sense that 
there's no, because they're not even remotely trying to present a kind of idealistic society, there's this almost free license to be, be as kind of raw as you like, do you think? Do you find that too? I think, to a degree, I think. I think, I don't know actually. I think, yeah, obviously to a degree there probably is some sort of honesty, freedom to go where you want to go, to be critical. And there's room to be critical in this because it's about thinking through categories of right and wrong and good and bad, because that's the premise of crime, isn't it? Mm. So I think that's where it is. There's a sort of an easy ability to think through those big issues and those fundamental questions around it. Right. And when it comes to South African and Brazilian crime fiction, are there any specific characteristics of it uh, in terms of the literature genre, um, specific to South Africa and Brazil when compared to others? Uh, not really. What's interesting is in some ways they are quite similar uh, and there's sort of this genre of uh, sort of crime fiction which is called sort of post-colonial crime fiction um, which links to the sort of the anglophone tradition of crime writing so I think people like Sherlock Holmes is part of an early sort of leader to that Edgar Allan Poe in the US uh, that's sort of this traditional anglophone tradition and post-colonial fiction sort of is a more recent development of that so there's a sort of connection this is what i'm arguing with brazilian crime writing in particular is actually part of that post-colonial anglophone tradition not actually part of the latin american tradition which is based more on sort of spanish because that's latin america spanish speaking right. it's it's based more on a spanish crime writing tradition which is slightly different than where they put the emphasis uh, so i that's one of the interesting things I find about Brazilian stuff is actually the connection is more to the sort of the tropes we see in typical Anglophone crime writing. Interesting. And is there is there a narrative of this coming from Brazil within itself? Do they write about the comparisons between Brazil and South Africa in their fiction as well? Not really. No, no. that's that's the neat sort of thing. Interesting. Have, have you had much push any pushback at all about that in terms of any arguments about that? Not really. Not really. Uh, one of the things I think you know I've well, firstly, I'm, I don't want to presume people have read it because they probably haven't, so I don't think there's an awareness. Well, the links in the what description. I've, so. what, I've, I've, what I've tried to do. So, but I do think there is this sort of set shared sort of sense of positionality between these two countries, and you know, take crime fiction out of it. Uh, Brazil and South Africa do occupy a similar space mm. uh, politically, and I think you know, fairly newly newly emerging democracies increasingly developing quite quickly, sort of brought part of this BRICS alliance, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, sort of dynamic, which is trying to push back against the sort of Western order, I suppose, and some of the stuff that's pushing. So I think there is a shared, they occupy a shared space, uh, which makes us think about some of the similarities within their different cultures. Is there also a similarity in the level of violence, both in the, maybe in the, literature but also just in societies they hear about would you say yeah i think there is uh, but they are both sort of often violent again they're not the only two but this often where some of the headlines are drawn from and again mm. that's probably the reason one of the reasons why crime writing has such an appeal in both countries yeah because it's latching on to something which is real and happening and affects people absolutely could you speak about that a little bit actually about what's going on right now um as in to knowledge of course in terms of South Africa in particular, I've seen it's being compared to having like a sort of mafia state these days, what I'm seeing being written about it. Mm -hmm. What is the current state of crime in South Africa in terms of just how bad the levels are? And why do you think there has been maybe a, a rise in crime recently? Yeah. Crime is always, it is high. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's, there's a lot, you, you can't get away from that. Some of the statistics are very much sort of skewed by sort of certain places, uh, you know, Cape Flats around Cape Town is full of gang, you know, there's lots of gang conflict there, which dries up sort of crime figures, areas of Johannesburg similarly. Uh, but it does affect most people and it is a constant sort of spectre, something you have to think about and pay attention to when you're moving around South Africa and moving around the city. Crime is there, it's an omnipresent threat. Uh, some of it is to do with the nature of policing. Uh, there's a lack of trust in the police. Uh, which is part of it. Uh, there's issues around corruption there, there's issues around is police really there to serve the people or just be used for the political 
beautiful space and that sort of similarities in as in America as we're seeing as well then. Yeah, so mm. some of it, uh, some of the, there's quite a lot written on that. Johnny Steinbeck, is, Johnny Steinberg, sorry, has written some good work on that from about a decade ago, sort of thinking about the nature of policing. Uh, some, of, some of it's to do with that, some of it is due to the hangover from apartheid. And obviously, you know, there was an embrace of the armed struggle uh, during the last years of apartheid, well, from 1960 really, but in 1980s, South Africa gets really violent. Uh, and this is some of the hangover from that in terms of like guns circulating. A lot of the guns involved in crime today can be linked back to that sort of period. Oh, really? Because there was no track on weapons, they were sort of put out there. Like the South African government fed a lot of guns into, there was a lot of, sort of what's known as black on black violence in South, in South Africa in the 1980s in the townships between two different sort of black political movements. And the South the apartheid state funneled guns into this conflict because they saw it as a way of. Well, if we can fuel that tension, yeah, the threat's going to come away from us and we can undermine the two movements which are pushing against us. So they sort of try and do that by funneling weapons in, but obviously they don't really care what happens to those weapons, they're just putting them into circulation and they still circulate. So that's some of it. Uh, so you've got, as I say, you've got that apartheid hangover, you've got issues around the police and you've got poverty. And societies in South Africa are still really, really unequal. And naturally I think when you have that sense of inequality and when you have people who are absolutely desperate crime is something that is considered. Mm. And in terms of crime fiction then, in terms of South African books you've written, um, sorry, read about mm -hmm. the, of the genre, what are some of the your favourites that you've read and why? Uh, I don't really, can't really think of why. Margie Orford some written some good stuff which is probably where I think about going to look. Marky Orford's really, really good author to think about. Okay, cool. And in terms of literature more broadly, I want to ask you a bit more. You mentioned that you, you feel like you can get a lot of really great truths mm -hmm. when reading literature. Could you expand on that a bit? Yeah, I think there is, there's a scope to think through issues and to sort of investigate what they are and what they mean and what they mean to different people. Uh, because you're creating characters and you can you can take them where you will. So there's that sort of scope, which I think fiction gives you, which not many other genres do to the length it allows you to sort of investigate. So I think that's why some of, I see this truth, because people are able to think and construct and to probe. Mm. So yeah, that's sort of some of it. And I suppose the book just, you know, you, you've asked for sort of, crime fiction right now I could think of. The sort of book that I think really demonstrates that to me is, I think there's, I've got it on the bookshelf there, but it's a Brazilian book called All Dogs Are Blue, uh, which is written by a Brazilian author who suffered from schizophrenia. And it's a bit, it's, in some ways it's his story and it's saying, this is what it's like. Yes. It's about probing schizophrenia, what it means and the treatment and some of the issues around that. And I think that really summed up to me how fiction has this ability to show other sides of the story, which we don't really hear of much, and to hear from people we don't really necessarily hear from, and to make us think anew and to challenge ourselves. And that's that's really hit me. And I've written on that book, I've written an article on that, trying to say, you know, I think it's telling us something big, but it's also fundamentally saying, this is what it's like, in his case, to have schizophrenia. So I think. That ability, I think, is what really resonates with me with fiction. And so, do you think with other um, areas, then perhaps they get so bogged down about being very specific and narrowing an argument down that you miss maybe the nuances or the personal journeys, for example, that you maybe mm -hmm. get in literature? Would you say? Yeah, I think to a degree. I think, if, yeah, I short answer is, is yes, probably. I think, particularly, sort of around the media and how media is set up as an industry nowadays, there is that quote, and you've mentioned it a few times today, that sort of closing down of, you know, oh, we want those, we want those quick lines which appeal to an audience that will set up that debate and that sort of antagonism. Uh, and I think a lot of the sort of, the quick consumerism of culture today in all these different forms, it's about quick sound bites and quick truths and things you can move away with very quickly. And, counter to this ability to think through and to reflect 
and that's where fiction, I think in particular theatre is another one, perhaps can come in and, and fill that space. Yeah, very well said. And I know um, you must forgive me because I know you said you're not a typical historian, mm -hmm. so, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Yeah. Why do you think history is an important subject to study and what have you gained through studying history? In terms of why I think it's important to study, and particularly African history, uh, because I don't really think it's history. I think it's still caught up in where we are now and where we're going. And you can't understand any of this stuff without knowing what's gone before. And I mentioned that with Rosemary's Hall, how they're trying to actively situate now in, in today. Mm. So I think that's why history matters, because it's not history. Cool. Very interesting. What was one book that you read, or maybe several, that you read when you were uh, young that had a profound impact on you, or, or just that you can remember having a really big impact on you at the time and perhaps even changed the way you saw the world? As I say, I've mentioned All Dogs Are Blue. Mm. That's probably one of them, and I'd recommend anybody can get hold of that, read it. It's, it's quite a short one to, to go through, but mm. it's, it's a really good read. Uh, I don't really know, actually. It's a hard question. <laughs> Uh, some of the stuff I think, you know, what got me started on South African history is reading a, a novel called Disgrace by Joan Kwasir, South African author, Nobel Prize winner, who sort of talks about the dynamics of truth and reconciliation in post-apartheid South Africa. So that struck me, that resonated with me, and that probably got me started on sort of my current journey. Interesting. And um, what was your biggest fear when you were younger? <laughs> Lots of things. <laughs> uh, ooh, I honestly don't really know the answer to that. <laughs> Most things have got me a bit on edge. Yeah. What's your biggest fear today? Biggest fear today, I think, is that I can get... I think you missed what matters and sort of had a, a, you know, a newborn ten months ago, she's now ten months, and I think sort of missing... Thanks but missing her and being part of her life and getting consumed in work and stuff, it makes you reflect, reflect a bit and think, you know, well, it's not really important. <laughs> so I think, you know, like some of the energy I used to invest into work and put always, you know, that's the thing you need to focus on and do. And I think you generally do when you're a bit younger. Uh, now I realise it's probably not so important, but I suppose my fear is I slip back into thinking it's important, <laughs> uh, particularly when I've got high marking loads and that sort of stuff going on. <laughs> What's one piece of advice you'd give to your younger self? Uh, I was told when I graduated to change the world uh, who by? Uh, by the Chancellor of XT University. Yeah. Uh, she said change the world because literally everybody went up to get their certificate. But I think push yourself, go and do stuff, change, like talk, speak, make your voice heard. Uh, get out of there. So I suppose that's my advice, go and change the world, go and make a noise. Right. And so then what would be your advice just to younger people today then? Would it be something similar? Yeah, similar. And sort of, it's better to regret doing something than not doing it. Mm. And on that note, Tom Pemphold, okay, cool. thank you very much. Well, for thanks, this. thanks. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you.